Well, welcome to Today in Music. Today with us, Jason Mraz. How are you? I'm great, Karen. How are you? <laughs> I'm so good. Thank you I for so asking. I so wanted to call you Alexa just for fun. You know, go ahead. She's like my cousin. Is she? You know, my play cousin. I like that. Mm -hmm. She's a good cousin to have. She's like the new Alice from Brady Bunch. <laughs> Everyone gets one in their house now. In, in some cases, multiple rooms. Yeah. She's, she's like Mr. Like, Deeds Butler. She just pops right. up everywhere. Oh, Rosie on the Jetsons. Yes. She's kind of like that. That's a very good comparison. But smaller. <laughs> Doesn't require as much oil. I hope not. Hope I really, not. It'd be very messy. Yeah. So let's talk about the new album. Oh, okay. I, and it's a shock. It's a big question to ask, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> You're out touring with the music now. Mm -hmm. How is the connection with the fans on this new project? Tons of fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, I'm, I'm so just blessed to still be here doing this and um, every night I get on stage and there's a part of me that's like wow I'm 41 and I'm still doing something that like an 18 year old does right but you get over that really quickly when um, you realize it's it's for entertainment it's for joy it's for theater it's for music and inside that music there's people there who are celebrating anniversaries birthdays um, just deepening the relationship from parent to child. I mean, you look out at the audience, there's just so many different things happening in that congregation or in that dynamic of the audience. And so it flips me from, wow, this is ridiculous, to, wow, this is really important. This mm -hmm. is fun. And, um, and the songs were a journey, certainly. They always are. They take me years to find between albums so that each album hopefully has valuable material that lasts and lasts, you know, longer than a trend or longer than just a, um, you know, a, a, a conversation of the moment. I, I look for a universality and things that might be enjoyed 20 years from now. Um, so I'm blessed to stand on stage and sing these songs with this new show. Last night in Seattle, we performed More Than Friends for the first time. I was going to ask you, you know, I want to say I'm the only one that's my fan favorite, but it's very clear it's just a fan favorite, that track. Oh, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, um, I'm blessed to travel with Raining Jane, who are um, four incredible women musicians and uh, all strong singers. and so. Chaska volunteered to play the Megan Trainer role and do the duet with me. And last night was our first attempt and it was a blast. Um, new songs are always challenging because even we don't know them fully. We don't know what they're capable of. Songs that have been tested and played for years become events. They become, they just become something in the show. And new songs, they take time. So, but with this tour, we've probably played, we've now played every song from the album. Um, at least half the album gets played every night, and people are loving it. They love Have It All. They love Let's See What the Night Can Do. Um, um, and I love them too. Yeah, yeah. I'm loving it. I would love to walk through the entire process, because I have so many layered questions about the context of your songs and then the fans becoming one with it. So let's mm -hmm. walk through, first of all, the process. It must be um, maybe challenging to share such personal feelings and things that you've lived through and, and make them available for mm. everyone. How did you come up with the idea to share such personal love concepts and then be willing to share it with the world? Um, it starts in a... In a um, I, I guess I would say a safe place where you're just emoting and you're emoting with an instrument, you're emoting on a, in a journal or on a typewriter or a computer. I use all different types of writing methods just to keep me feeling artistic. Um, and it's a practice. So songwriting for me is a practice. It's something I do weekly so that my catalog is always building, my instrument's always in tune, my writing utensils are always available. And if I'm really lucky, an urgent message comes through or a message of um, healing, um, uh, 
transcending something that I've just been dealing with for a long time. Um, who knows? But if it, when you're there practicing your writing and that message and that, that meaning aligns with that practice, it's transformative. And if I'm transformed in the experience, then I'm like, then I know that there's magic here and that this might be really special on stage. My, so my next step then, once I have a small batch of magic tricks, I'll take them to a coffee shop and I'll take them for a test drive. Oh. And I won't say much about them, but I will practice setting them up for the listener. I love storytelling before a song because I feel like it primes the ear for what they're about to hear. Um, but in a coffee shop setting, I like to just play new songs and, and see what people say after the show. See what they say um, as far as, oh, that song I liked especially. So get a little bit of feedback. Mm -hmm. um, and then honestly, the next step um, in the process is really the A&R department. Yeah. <laughs> like, I still have to get A&R excited about my songs and so that they can take it to the rest of the company and say, hey, Jason's got some, some magical songs. And that's a process because mm -hmm. they hear it all, mm -hmm. you know, and they have a high standard. Um, I, so I have to enroll them in my, you know, philosophy um, and then what I think will also work live. And some things that work live don't necessarily work great on recordings. Right. I have a few funny songs, but they don't work great on recordings because there's no laugh track. Mm. And there's no context. You think I'm just being sarcastic or something. Okay. So the process is, is actually a, a challenging one, mm -hmm. trying to curate these transformative and meaningful songs and these love songs. And I love singing a love song because it feels purposeful. When people listen, they're loving you, right? Listening is such a great way to love someone. So I feel it's my responsibility to reflect that love back or to sing songs of love to presence the love that we are currently experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, singing is also my first love. So it, it feels more in alignment if I'm singing a love song because my body vibration while singing is that of love. So if the message is love, then it's, it goes even higher. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard artists say, and, and maybe you feel this way and maybe you don't, that once songs become so big that they are no longer your song as the singer, they become the fan song. And yeah. sort of what you were saying about when you look out in the crowd and all the iterations of love that you see out there, is yeah. that something you experience and big how time. does it feel? Big time, feels the best. Um, and then it's just my duty to show up and be of service to that song, mm -hmm. to not screw it up, to remember all the lyrics and make it great and maybe even make it longer so that it lasts longer in the, in the, the live setting. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real blessing when that happens. Um, and going back to something you asked about the process of love, my, uh, or singing about love and singing about intimate things. Um, a, I used my wife as an inspiration on this record, at mm -hmm. least for the final set, the final playlist. Um, she and I got engaged at the end of my last record. She's really fed me for about three records, <laughs> um, but we were married at the end of the last record, and um, and she's been a constant inspiration, and she's been game to let me just sing about our life and the little things I love and notice about being married and what I notice about her. But to go back even further, my mom uh, has always found it interesting that I can stand on stage in front of you know thousands of people mm -hmm. and say these really intimate things, mm -hmm. but I actually have trouble doing it in my personal life. Yeah. So it's almost like a safer space to turn uh, something that's difficult to say to someone one-on-one. Mm -hmm. -on -one, to turn it into art, to turn it into theater, and where I feel like on stage I have this safe space to express something mm -hmm. in hopes that it lands with that person, um, that, they, that they hear me and feel me expressing it. Um, and in that type of communication, where I feel like I'm, I'm actually trying to be personal with someone, I think it does still connects with the other thousands who are listening. Mm -hmm because I guess art does that for us. Right. You know, it can, music uh, especially, 
can turn this conversation into something way more beautiful. You know, a good so melody. have you ever talked to your wife? What is it like for her to hear words that were inspired by her and, and have it be embraced by strangers? Yeah, she, she gets it because she's known my life for so long. Mm -hmm. um, when it, I think when it first started happening, she, was, she would just blush a lot. She always hears the songs first. And I do ask for permission. For example, especially we made a music video for Might As Well Dance on this record, and we just used our wedding footage. Mm -hmm. So I definitely needed her permission for <laughs> right. that. Uh, but yeah, she gets all the demos and first listen and first right of refusal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in the space between your last album, Getting Married, releasing this album, where were the inspirations and, and how do you jot them down? Are you out on a date night and you're like, hold on, honey, I've got to write these things down because this is how I'm feeling and I want to share it? Yeah, so I've always got a pen okay. <laughs> close by and it will be. I'm like, babe, I, hold on for a second. <laughs> It'll be a napkin or I usually have a little small notebook um, I, if I have to, I'll use the notes on my phone, which, but I hate that because it just looks like you're using your phone right. to check an email or something. Um, but yeah, just try to capture as many ideas as they come because I, I can't trust that that idea is going to wait for me mm -hmm. to get home. Mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, constantly doing things. And my wife will see me check out for a while too. <laughs> and she'll say, are you doing a puzzle? Which is what she calls songwriting. Oh. It's like, yeah, I'm working on a puzzle right now. <laughs> yeah. So you're part of, I think, a, a wonderful short list of artists that are synonymous with wedding celebrations, love celebrations. Yeah. What do you play at your wedding? Do you perform at your wedding? Uh, I did. I perform. Well, I actually lip sync. I did a lip sync at my wedding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> to a song that I wrote and recorded for my wife called The Best Thing I Can Do For You Is Clean Our House <laughs> and clean our litter box. And there's a bunch of things about our house that I would do and would rather do. Uh, so it was always a favorite. That song was always a favorite of hers. So I did like a Bollywood style oh. lip sync and dance number yeah, to that. But the rest of the wedding was Michael Franks and Sade. Okay. It was just Michael Franks and Sade. It was, <laughs> it was a little too mellow, actually. <laughs> but then we had a live band that played 80s music, bluegrass oh. style. Can Love Cannon. Alexa, play Love Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> Check them out, they're amazing. So, I suspect maybe your fan base thinks they know you, you know, inside it. You're so giving with your lyrics and your emotions. What is something that you're into on your own personal time that people might be surprised by? I don't know, I feel like I've shared a lot um, through the years. I do a lot of yoga, that's my, well, I don't know if it's a lot, but I like to just lounge in a stretching position. <laughs> okay. It feels good to me. If, and it feels productive. Mm -hmm. um, you can't, I can't turn my brain off. Mm -hmm. So I feel like yoga is a, a fun way for me to sort of ride that energy, harness energy, and, and feel like I might actually have some control over that mechanism. Right that it doesn't control me. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's me in my free time. <laughs> okay. Underwear, lunging. What about music? What are you listening to when you're able to take a break from thinking about your own music? Oh, I'm constantly on discover mode. Okay. I love uh, the current age of the record store is in your pocket. Mm -hmm. I love that. So. Um, I, I love meeting people and finding out what they're into mm -hmm. and then ask for some recommendations. So I, I recently made a friend in reggae and I said, please let me, I, I said, I love generous echo dub. Okay. What can you turn me on to? And so he said, well, I like things from 1976 to 1982 mm -hmm. that came out of King Tubby's mixing studio. I was like, tell me more. <laughs> um, so this week I'm really into dub reggae, mm -hmm. but uh, a month ago I was way into Woody Guthrie. Okay. You know, songs from nearly a hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what's cool about the age we're living in right now is you can dig like you're in a record store right. online and just get lost. So I feel like I'm just in a constant 
period of discovery. Can you tell me about the first moment that you fell in love with music, that you can remember music really impacting you? Yeah, I was, it was just always there. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember the first moment, but uh, we had a piano in our house and it, from a very young age, my mom, I remember her sitting me on her lap and shaping my fingers to play the chord and learning chopsticks. And I just thought it was magic to hear this big instrument make all that sound. And then I too could sing with it and add a, a vibration and create a harmony. And it's just something I've always been into. And when I was in second grade, my music teacher, Miss McChesney, asked me to sing a solo. And I didn't know what that was. She said, just sing by yourself. I sang, I think it was a Christmas song, Silent Night or something. And I loved hearing it in the big music room mm -hmm. at school. And I loved the reaction that it would get from the teacher and the other students. And I just knew from a very, very young age that there was, there was magic happening mm -hmm. and that I wanted to know more about it and just do it more often. What advice would you share for someone who is just getting the courage to put their lyrics to paper, to, to the microphone, to the public? <laughs> well, it never gets easier, um, but the, the courage gets easier. So uh, I guess just lean in to the discomfort. Mm -hmm. Discomfort doesn't mean danger. Mm -hmm. It just means, wow, this is, this is gonna be new. <laughs> um, but it never gets easier because when you write the next song, the page is blank. It always is. You always have to start from scratch and you're always gonna be playing it for people whose ears have never heard that expression or, um, you know, I have to assume too that every day at the concerts, there's people that have never heard me. So I've, you know, I, there's always that little bit of nerves there. Are they gonna like this? So you just have to lean in and go for it and know that you like it. And that's what matters. Yeah. What matters is that you enjoy your art. That way you can enjoy it in your home. You can enjoy it if you've made a recording, you listen to it in your car and enjoy it. You can gift it to your family and enjoy that feeling. Uh, I used to love making mixtapes and mix CDs for my parents when I was working on an album. It's like, this is almost the album, but it's a few extra songs that aren't gonna make the cut. You know, I just love that feeling. And so I think for someone who's just getting into it now to um, A, take your time. I do believe you don't have to put your very first song up on YouTube. You can, you can work on your craft under the radar so that when you do put art out there, it's great art and so that you can be really proud of it. What's a moment that you can recall was tough in that moment as far as the industry goes, but maybe in hindsight, you realized where it led you? Um, golly. I was really nervous about The Remedy, which was the first big pop song I ever had. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was, it was one of my very first co-writes and I was a, I considered myself like a punk coffee shop, like a punk singer songwriter. Okay. I was singing sensitive love songs that were a little jazzy, a little scatty, a little rappy. It was a little all over the place. Um, and then suddenly I found myself in a songwriting session with The Matrix and we turned this little rap song idea into this big pop song, The Remedy, and it scared me. I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. Mm -hmm. It's like, how am I gonna do this? I, I play at coffee shops with yeah. a guy on a djembe. How am I gonna do this track that has 90 tracks layered on it? And the chorus starts before the pre-chorus is even finished. The voices overlap. So I didn't understand any of it. And then I also thought, if I put this out, I'm selling out and I'm becoming a pop thing, which right. I didn't care about. And it was very uncomfortable. So I threw the disc away. I was like, no thanks. And in the middle of recording my record, the first record, I get to the studio and everyone is there early. Management, 
producer, record label, and they're listening to the Remedy demo. I was like, what are you guys doing? They're like, oh, we're, we gotta record this song. I was like, nope, no we don't, not, not what I'm into. Mm -hmm. Whew, man, they put the pressure on me. They're <laughs> like, this is a great song. Like, listen to the, to the, take the medicine that's in this music. Don't worry your life away. Let's see if we can beat the demo. Maybe you don't like the demo. Let's just try it. Whew. <laughs> it was an uncomfortable moment, and I cried during the tracking of the song because I just thought that I was creating something. I, I was creating something that I never expected I, that I would create. But what ended up happening was the song started to connect with people in a really special way. So, because that song was originally inspired by my friend Charlie, who was diagnosed with Ewan sarcoma, a rare kind of bone cancer, when he was about 21. And part of me not wanting to do the song in that scale was exploiting his situation. But his mantra through his entire treatment was, I'm not going to worry my life away. I'm going to do what the doctors tell me to do, and I'm going to beat this cancer, and I'm going to live my life. And his message created such a wave of inspiration through our whole community. And so here I am in this song, and I have my friend's blessing, and I said, all right, I'm just going to try it on and not worry and see what happens. And the song began to connect with people who were fighting cancer. And I was completely transformed by that experience. So I went almost, you know, it happened probably over a short season in the spring of 2003 where I went from, you know, egoic, trying to get the girl, where's the weed, I want to rap, like that attitude, mm -hmm. to, oh wow, I can be of service in a bigger way using uh, positive articulation, powerful words, powerful mantras, uh, showing up in a way that's of service for others rather than how can this serve me, Right. you know? So that was a big learning experience and it has affected the rest of my career it really has that's beautiful yeah thank you for sharing that yeah, no worries <laughs> sorry uh, it was such a long no, story no it's great it was wonderful alexa so, give us the shorter version <laughs> no no alexa doesn't do that <laughs> we need the whole <laughs> version of that one so let's talk about the new album what what do you want people to hear in this album Oh, that love is still the answer. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the closing piece. And for me, the last song on an album is always the best place to squeeze in that, hey, if you didn't get the message yet, here it is mm -hmm. one last time. Um, that love is still the answer. Um, it, it appears as though we're less loving than ever or we're more um, divided. Mm. I don't think that's true. I just think more of it's being filmed and being shared. Therefore, we're able to actually see where our shadows remain, right? So um, the best way to um, shine light on those shadows is to just remember that we are love. You know, we come into this earth, the first thing we need is love. Yeah. The first thing, if we don't get it, we don't last very long. And I don't think that ever goes away. Um, so that's, that's really the message is love, love, love. And it, and it sounds cliche, but, but it's not, Yeah. you know, I mean, what else are we here to do? Everything else is entertainment. You know, it's what matters is breathing in and out and, and are we loving and being loved? You yeah. Know? Well, while I have the opportunity to talk to you, I'd love to get a little bit more in depth on the track, More Than Friends with Megan Trainer. Okay. I think you guys are moving towards making it another single and yeah. um, just love to hear some backstory on it. How did you guys connect? You know, just anything you can share about it. Sure. So Megan had just finished making her album with Andrew Wells in the same studio that I was moving into to make my album with Andrew Wells. So we, we overlapped. Mm -hmm. And that's really how we overlapped mm -hmm. was through the miracle of scheduling. <laughs> And, uh, but I was a fan of hers anyway. I knew of her and Kevin Kadish when they were working on um, All About That Bass, mm -hmm. which now has billions 
of views. Not just one billion, multiple billions <laughs> right. of views, which is incredible. Um, so we thought, yeah, we should, we should try something together because she's also very funny. And I thought, well, maybe we could write something funny. And I had this funny song called More Than Friends that I had attempted to write that's based on my wife saying more than friends as a way to describe her love for something. So like, for example, if this were a cup of coffee and I said, babe, how do you like your coffee? She said, oh, I like it more than friends. <laughs> um, I'm gonna eat this banana. You do that. We, uh, we're big on bananas here at Amazon. I love that. We have banistas outside. What does a banista do? They hand out bananas instead of coffee. Oh. Yeah. I don't know if they like peeled it for you? No, just, they just uh, readily have them available. Can they whittle it into something unique? <laughs> I'll ask for you. Write my name in it? <laughs> so Megan and I were fans of each other and we decided to uh, get together one afternoon and write a song and we were committed to make it great. I played her more than friends. She's like, it's funny, it can be better. So we kept sort of the basic idea and started from scratch. And that girl can sing yeah. and she can produce and she, uh, she made it happen, that's for sure. Because I, I, I'm just happy writing a song. I don't care where it goes. But she's like, no, we're gonna make this thing great and it's gonna work and people are gonna hear it. Um, which I, I love that about her. So we wrote it and produced it all on the same day. And that was it. We went our separate ways. And then I saw her again when we made a little music video for oh, it. Early tidbits. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know if that video is ever going to come out. Well, I hope it does. I do too. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's, it was a thrill to work with her. She's, she's fierce. You guys are in, I think, speaking for you. Such a great place with you being sort of in this newlywed stage and she's newly engaged oh, yeah. too, so a lot of love flowing. Totally, and that was part of the conversation that day. Like, we knew that writing More Than Friends was a great choice because mm -hmm. um, her man was there and she's so smitten with him. And mm -hmm. I'm still in a newlywed kind of honeymoon phase. Awesome. Yeah, you were correct. Correct <laughs> assumption. Good, good. Well, thank you so much. We've stolen so much of your time, and I just loved hearing the stories. Nothing was stolen. <laughs> well, thank you, and good luck on the road and the album. And I know it's growing and growing and growing every day with our customers. I appreciate They're that. They're feeling the love. Thank you. And I think that's one of the beauties of the streaming world, too, is that people can find it at the right time. Mm -hmm you know, and then easily share it at yeah. the right time with someone who they think might need it the most or might enjoy it the most. So yeah. I'm, I'm not in any hurry. Good. I like to assume that someone's listening to this in the year 2034 and they're just now discovering the No album mm -hmm. and they're learning about Karen and all <laughs> of the things she's hosting <laughs> and all the bananas that Jason ate during the interview. and. <laughs> We'll get you right down to the banistas after that. And the cup of peppermints that he drank during the interview. Mm. 